tonight on The Josh Kornbluth Show. There are great layers of secrecy and mystique inside the business. It, it operates by a carnival code. A fascinating look inside the world of professional wrestling. And... I want to wrestle! I want to wrestle! Do you know someone who can wrestle me? Can Josh survive a bout with a San Jose martial arts star? I talk to strangers on the street. Make conversation on the boulevard. You never know the types I'll meet. Perhaps they're just like me and you. My guest on today's show is Irvin Muchnick. Irvin has written a wonderful new book called Wrestling Babylon. He actually comes from royalty of professional wrestling, and I can't wait to talk to him about this sport, this, this form of entertainment that I have loved since I was a little kid. Let's digress. The Josh Kornbluth Show is made possible in part by the KQED Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund and the members of KQED. So I'm here with Irvin Muchnick. We're inside the steel cage as befitting, you know, uh, pro wrestling, which is the subject of your book. Actually, okay, this isn't really steel cage. This is, I believe, the dog prevention fence of Lori Halloran, my producer. So, Margaret, you can, can actually take away. But <laughs> I thought it was a really wonderful effect, I, I think, and affordable within the budget. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. Pleasure. Um, I loved your book. I'm going to hold up not the book itself, but the manuscript of it, because the book, as we're speaking, has not yet come out, but by the time people are seeing this, it will be coming out, or it will be out already. Wrestling Babylon, pile-driving tales of drugs, sex, death, and scandal. Yeah, definitely work on the binding a little bit. This is a fantastic book, and I love pro wrestling, and maybe not everyone who's watching loves pro wrestling or grew up the way I did, so let me just explain. And then I actually let you talk, this being an interview show. But I just want to tell you, my grandpa, Julius Selden, came over from the Shtetls. And when I was a little kid, I would go over to grandpa and grandma's house, and we would sit on the couch, and we would watch on Channel 47 in New York, Spanish language channel. We would watch professional wrestling, and my grandpa would go, Oof, like this on the couch, Oof, with each time Bruno San Martino, who was the champion then, would throw someone a pin or someone would get him. And he got so into it, he would go down to the Felt Forum down to Madison Square Garden and he would watch these, he would watch these <clears throat> things live. And I remember the day when Grandpa decided it was fixed. He told me, he said, I think it's fixed. Bruno San Martino, the champion, had been dethroned and then rethroned in an obviously weird way. So it's a big part of my life. You that's yourself right. You're come right. from uh, Eastern European Jewish dis uh, background. That's right. And, and, and one of the, the uh, uh, let's not get too heavy here, but, uh -huh. but Neil Gabler has written about how Hollywood was largely the creation of Eastern European Jewish immigrant uh, impresarios. Yeah. And, and, and same is true, really, of modern professional wrestling. And my uncle, Sam Muchnick, uh, was the, uh, I guess you'd call him the Pete Rosell of professional wrestling in the era before cable TV. So I grew up watching this stuff since I was knee-high to a turnbuckle. And in fact, what you talk about, and I, I find it really affecting, is the scene that essentially your book opens with is on November 22nd, 1963? That's correct. And it is a day that is known in infamy for the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. But it's also a day that's a major day in your pro wrestling history. Can you well, describe that, that, that look, night? All the wrestlers were already in town. This is it in was St. Louis. Was in St. Louis. Yeah. And my uncle made the decision on the fly that, that uh, it was too late to cancel the show. And, but unlike Pete Rozelle, who was totally uh, uh, excoriated for his decision to play the National Football League games on, on Sunday, two days later, everybody in St. Louis thought it was great. In fact, they thought it was classy because my uncle had Monsignor Louis Meyer, the uh, director of the youth department for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, do a prayer, and then they played the national anthem, and then everybody settled back and watched Luthez defend his National Wrestling Alliance uh, heavyweight championship against the evil German Fritz von Erich. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot of, lot of stuff going on that day. And there's a lot of stuff yeah. that comes out of that, too, because the yeah. von Erich family is an amazing story I want to talk about. Yeah. And, and, and also the champ. What, what's his name again? Luthez. Luthez sounds like he was the son of a Hungarian shoemaker? Yes, he was. And, and, and Luthez was really uh, a towering figure in, in uh, 
20th century uh, wrestling history. He just died a few years ago uh -huh. in his 80s, and he was like really the number one performer from the 19, late 1930s through the mid 1960s. And let's, I want to describe for people, just for any people who maybe haven't been watching pro wrestling ever, or wouldn't even think of it, <laughs> uh, to describe what it is, what it is. It's professional, it is, it's wrestling in which it's pre-scripted what is no. going to happen. Yeah, it, it, that, that's true. I mean, every wrestling match needs to have stipulations. Uh -huh. So I think this conversation should have them too. I mean, okay. we've already been in a steel cage. Yes, I right. mean, is, it, is it a Canadian lumberjack match? Is it a New Jersey street fight? Is it Urban, a, a Texas I, death match? Is as it I a warned Canadian you on the phone, match? I am keeping okay. a right. foreign object in my trunks right. just in case this gets out of hand. But, I mean, the one stipulation I want to have is if you want French semiotics, go read Roland Barthes. Uh -huh. If you want to read some academic treatise on wrestling, you know, go find Professor Hieronymus Buttox. <laughs> but um, if, you want, if you want to uh, get a book of reporting, then read what I've written. Now, what you say is true. Wrestling is pre-scripted. Uh, this was like a closely held secret for many, many years. I didn't know it when and, I was little. And, 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 uh, uh, there are great layers of secrecy and mystique inside uh -huh. the business. It, it operates by a carnival code and it started, that they call kayfabe. Kayfabe, which you mentioned in your book several times. Kayfabe basically means, and, and everybody knows what kayfabe is now. I mean, not everybody, but everybody who's a wrestling fan, oh, yeah. most wrestling fans know. It basically means don't let the marks, don't let the, you know, people yeah. on the street know what's going on. By the way, that's how we refer to our viewers also as no. marks. It's, it's just, it's a public television thing. It's a term of respect in our case. So a funny thing happened about 20 years ago, and this uh -huh. was after my uncle retired, and uh, after the old systems of wrestling sort of broke down and cable television and home video and deregulation created the opportunity for a national marketing base. Yeah. In, in years past, wrestling was sort of like the water. It was a little bit different in every region. What you watched in New York was not what I watched in St. Louis. No, and it had and a, we can talk yeah. about that. And it had a very yeah. different feel, too. Right. It had a very, it was sort of homemade feel, kind of an immigrant-y kind of feel. Yeah. You could, it was, um, it was sort of quaint, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But now there's a national marketing base and, and, and the, the current kingpin of wrestling who, who is so successful that he was in the Forbes 400 list of uh -huh. the wealthiest Americans after his initial uh, public stock offering in 1998, uh -huh. the same week as Martha Stewart, by the way. Yeah. But he hasn't landed behind bars yet. Unlike, not yet. Not no, yet. It's come unlike close. Martha Stewart. Yeah. Uh, Vince he, McMahon. Vince McMahon, he, he basically uh, exposed the business. He decided to let everyone in on the joke. That, that it was, that really, was kayfabe. You know, and, and the reason was he didn't want to pay taxes to state athletic commissions anymore because uh -huh. there was such big money from pay-per-view and other ways. So he said, look, you know, and, and all the old line carny promoters said, this is going to kill the business. Letting and, people know that yeah, it's... Instead, it's bigger than ever. And, it, and so, and you talk about him, he really is a central, maybe the central character in your book, in, in these articles, because he really changed, he changed pro wrestling. And to me, you make a really excellent case that Vince McMahon was part of a change in our whole culture. Yeah, there's no question that, that pro wrestling has left a big, big footprint on mainstream sports and on society and on political discourse. I mean, you think of talk radio or... People, when people know, yell at each other, yeah. it's like those interviews. It's, a, it's a that cutting people, a heel promo on, on the other now guy. Now talk about, because I love yeah. these terms too. Yeah, there's, yeah. 